So welcome everybody and um, thank you for um, again the introduction and for the opportunity to be here. So um, I'm going to talk to you about my project on preventing emerging infectious diseases hopefully but I will kind of start to try to answer the question that originally po was posed for this panel about why there is so much distrust and how to regain trust and, and communication and how to tell the truth. So I'm going to start with um, uh, two graphs that I'm going to show you over here. Um, and if you look at them, they both list the same nations in orders one, two, three. It's the United, King the United States, United Kingdom. And then on the left side, you see the Netherlands is coming in third. And on the, on the right side, you see the Netherlands coming in fourth after Belgium. Now, it looks like these are very similar results and these are consistent. However, the one on the left side is a figure coming from the GHS index. This is the Global Health Security Index that was conducted in 2019. And what you see on the left side is the country's best prepared for a global epidemic or a pandemic as we saw it in 2019. On the right side, what you see is the countries most affected or most direly affected by COVID-19. This is a year later coming from 2020 November. And so if we look at all the reasons for difficulties in trusting science and in communication, this may be one of them that within a short year, the same three countries went from being the best prepared for an event like COVID-19 to being the worst affected. And then the question obviously arises, where is the devil hidden? What are we not seeing in 2019? And so I'm gonna to try to give you a little insight on what we think that went wrong over here. So when we talk about best prepared countries for epidemics and infectious diseases, we might have to ask the question, what are we preparing for? And so in terms of the diseases that are most commonly known, whether it's um, single cell parasites, um, viruses, or bacteria, these are just three examples. When we prepare for any of these, the first and foremost thing that is established is the host and potentially the vector, so the system we're looking at. For malaria, probably a lot of you know that it's humans are affected through a, a tiger mosquito. For yellow fever, it's the same thing that stands, and for MRSA, it's human-to-human -human transmission. And the reason we look at these very close-knit systems is because there is this common perception that parasites specialize to exploit their hosts and vectors. So, this is what they call host parasite coevolution, um, which means that parasites and hosts and their vectors form these intimate relationships. Now, how do we assume this happens? The way this happens is that, let's say there's a parasite in some wildlife species, and then that parasite, since it's specialized, all of its or most of its um, members are going to be exploiting this host because there's a close-knit adaptation going on over here. So in order for this parasite to find a new host, it first needs to mutate. And then that new mutation is going to be able to infect a new host. This is the common perception. This is how we understand parasites to function. And this is what global health security prepares for. Now, the bad news in this case is that this is unpredictable. We never know when a new mutation shows up. But the good news that we perceive to be the good news is that this type of host switching event is rare because it needs a very particular type of mutation for this parasite to be able to move on. So we're not really preparing for this because on the one hand, we don't know when it's gonna happen. And on the other hand, it doesn't happen a lot often. Now, this was the common perception um, in terms of parasites. So when we figure out the what, the where, the how, and the when, the answer to the question as to what we are preparing for, we have been preparing for the devil we know. Something that is well described, something that we know how it works, where it works, and which species are affected. 
And so this had been an, a long lasting view in terms of global health until a review in 2004. Now this review, what it did was it described diseases that had shown up in the past decade that were either completely new, showed new symptoms that they hadn't shown so far, appeared in locations that they hadn't been known to appear, or were resistant to the treatment that they had not been resistant to thus far. And they called these groups of diseases emerging infectious diseases. And so in 2004, there was a warning sent that there's this new sets of diseases that are novel things popping up in unpredicted locations, and we need to grab a hold of them and something needs to be figured. So 13 years later, there was a follow-up done on how we have advanced in stopping emerging infectious diseases. And this was the result of the 2017 review. So in the last, in the 13 years between these two reviews, the number of emerging infectious diseases have grown threefold. They have exponentially grown more in numbers, grown more severe in effects, and just as unpredictable and unpreventable as we, we know them. So the question led back to science, what are we not seeing over here? If we're all so prepared, why do these keep on coming? So what's the new thing over here? Now it turns out that the new thing is a little different from how we imagine diseases to work. It is true that diseases or pathogens live in particular species, but when they do so, they don't all look the same. Every single pathogen is a little different from the other. There is a large variety of genotypes and then that by phenotypes in pathogen populations. And when these phenotypes encounter species that they are able to infect, they are going to readily do so. When they do this, and when we look at this system, the big difference here is that there is no new mutation that's required. The parasites possess the genetic capacities that is needed to infect the new host. How is that possible? It's because of a misunderstanding we've had. Parasites don't specialize to their host. Parasites specialize to conditions. For SARS-CoV-2, it doesn't matter if the receptor that is, it is able to bind to is in a human, a dog, a mink, an ape, a bat. It's not the host, it's just the mere conditions. And wherever they find these conditions, they are going to flourish. Now, what's, again, I'm gonna give you the good news and the bad news in this. The bad news, the good news first, the good news is that this becomes predictable because there is no, no new mutation happening over here. So whichever variants we find in the wild species, we already know what the parasite is capable of. So we can predict what it's gonna be capable of. The bad news is, is that because there is no new mutation needed, host switching becomes frequent. And host switching is what we call emergence. So this new evolutionary theorem is what's called the Stockholm paradigm describing how emerging infectious diseases work in this evolutionary framework, as opposed to the one we believed that was happening. Now, this is one part of the question here in terms of truths. We need true science. We need the good science, and we need science to be able to correct itself. The other part here is we need action. What do we do now that we know the good science? And there's multiple calls for actions being taken, but oftentimes there's a misunderstanding of who should do what. And when scientists like myself call for action against COVID, it's kind of like the somebody do something. And what we need to do is we need to figure out who we are asking to do and what we are asking them to do. 
And so this is the part of taking action with the infrastructure we have. So when we look at global healthcare in terms of infectious disease prevention, there are three different scales we need to be looking at. One is global public health frameworks. The second is regional healthcare regulations like EU regulations, for instance. And the third is local policy environments, which can be down to nations or municipalities or even cities. So when we talk about infectious disease prevention, in, on the global scale, what we need to look at is international guidelines provided by WHO, CDC, centralized disease management protocols and disease monitoring and how these are being done. In terms of EU regulations, it's regional and national health administrations that we need to work with, healthcare infrastructure and accessibility in particular regions and cross-sector collaboration that needs to be and is facilitated. And in terms of local policy environment, it takes stakeholders that are always connected through various ways when it comes to disease. And we need to look at local funding and availability of personnel who can be involved in such decisions and policies. And we need to look at what data is being collected. So overall, we need to look at the policy infrastructure that allows us to do something. And if we put these two together, the science and the policy, when we know what we are up against and we know what to do and how to do it, this is what will and hopefully is going to result in increased truthfulness, increased quality of the output of both research and policy. So this is a very, very recent article we've published on this general approach. This is actually online since yesterday. So it's very fresh, um, fresh off the, off the cook pot. And so in terms of my work, what I'm working on, I am working within the framework of the DAMA protocol. So the DAMA protocol is a four-step science policy protocol. I'm gonna give you the very gist of it and then show you which part I'm most really responsible for. So Document Assets Monitor Act is a four-step way of predicting and preventing emerging infectious diseases. The document phase involves fundamental research in virology, for instance, bacteriology, parasitology, of documenting the microbes that are out there that can be of um, concern. The assessment is where we assess them from a phylogenetic perspective and figure out the risk of this particular microbe being transferred to humans or livestock or some relevant populations. If these microbes turn out to be high risk, then those are the ones that we need to monitor in terms of distribution, in terms of interfaces with human populations, with livestock. And finally, if we know the interfaces and we know the danger zones, we can act to prevent an emergence of a particular disease. Now, in terms of this action, this is my area of research on how to act and how to combine the three steps, the first three steps of fundamental biology with science policy preventing an emergence. And so again, I'm gonna give you these three levels or scales I'm working on. In terms of the global framework, my work involves conceptualizing this evolutionary prevention and global health security approaches. Um, I analyze current frameworks, I analyze current protocols, and then I suggest ways of in implementing or adjusting these frameworks to kind of incorporate this prevention. In terms of the regional um, uh, suggestions, what we do is we map gaps and opportunities in policy envir environments where we can kind of intervene with these preventive measures. This involves building national scenarios on possible health security measures. One of these are going to be on COVID and building transdisciplinary task force, task forces targeting particular EIDs. And finally, the local is establishing and utilizing stakeholder expertise. This includes talking to local stakeholders and policy making, establishing multi-actor projects, and then the establishment of citizen science and paraprofessional networks and programs. So I hope I am still well within the time. Thank you everyone for your attention and looking forward to questions.